Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Jesse. This <laughs> week at the round table of dim lighting, it's not Link. It's moi. It's my <laughs> wonderful wife, Jesse. Me, that's Lane me, right? McLaughlin. I'm your wife. Uh, <laughs> you might be a little bit confused because Jesse is sitting where I usually sit, which was her request. I don't really understand it. But, this- uh, you don't know really, why. Can I tell you why I did that? Yeah, I will say you're making me feel a little uncomfortable. In my and own that podcast. was the point. <laughs> <laughs> this was a power move. Okay, you did it. Because you know I'm the guest here, mm-hmm. although I have been a main character for many years. Oh, <laughs> uh huh. You yes. You, mm-hmm. I can't disagree with that. And you know you're comfy. When I was nervous about this, you were saying like, "Don't worry, it's not a big deal. It's nothing." And yeah, it's nothing because you do this literally every day. Um. So do you? Are you saying that when somebody is entering into a situation where they might be a little bit nervous, it's not best? I'm just minimizing. I'm just doing what McLaughlin's do. We minimize mm-hmm. things if somebody. If somebody gets hurt, if somebody dies, if somebody is going through something very difficult, we're like, yeah, but yeah, I mean, but look on the bright side. It's not that big of a deal. I just wanted you to feel a sliver of the discomfort that I felt. Yeah. I'm not, feel. I, I'm so, not used to talking to people on the right side of my face. That's right. And so, so you know, it was, it was a power move, and I'm proud of that. Uh, do you feel comfortable? Are you you good to go? I did. I actually do feel much more comfortable doing this, knowing that you're going to be here because you're going to make me laugh. Well, and... don't speak too soon. <laughs> <laughs> and that is is going to make me feel more like myself instead of being like a weird person that's on camera. The weird person part is fine. We were talking about that. The on camera part's a little tough. Well, let's just pretend mm-hmm. that we're just at our house mm. in our not in our bedroom. <laughs> just let's just be in the kitchen, okay? Okay. We're in the kitchen. I, do. I have my tea. And we're just Thank talking. You, Jenna. And this for is like me tea. we find out later that someone mm. is taking the the Nest Cam footage and putting it on the internet. But really, we didn't know what we were being filmed. We didn't know what these things in front of us were, these mm-hmm. microphones. Do you sounds, know what I mean? I do, but that sounds like it uh, introduces a whole other set of problems. Who is this person in our kitchen or with access to the cameras in our house? Apparently, it's actually pretty easy to get access to to the, to the cams. That's why when I'm at home, um, I'm always acting as if I am on a TV show. Mm. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I never say or do anything at home th- th- out. that I would not want captured for a reality television show. It's like I basically live my life as if I am on Big Brother. <sighs> and that's one of the things that makes me such a great life partner, right? Totally, babes. <laughs> we asked you uh, to ask us, and especially Jesse, questions that we are now going to go through. Uh <sighs> So, I mean, basically it was anything, anything that you wanted to ask. And some are voicemails, mm-hmm. some are tweets. Mm-hmm. My fave. Do you want to get started? Or would you and like... I'm going to continue to call them tweets. Oh, Let's yeah. just. I'm not going to call them I don't call them whatever the other thing is. Yeah. Look, you want to talk about how you feel about that whole thing? Not you, cause, really. Cause I don't want to start this off. You're mourning the death. No, of, I am. The slow death of Twitter. I am. Cause and it's been difficult for me to be a, just be a part of. You love Twitter so dang much. You're so good at it. You really are really good that's at it. That's very sweet. I don't think that's true, but no, I no. think I you just really care about it. it more than you. You understand it. I like it. You just don't go to Twitter to look at what people are saying about you like I do. I like how, and I guess this is really true for any social media app, but for some reason it feels especially true on Twitter that I can look at like news, fashion, Find out, like, some celeb gossip, talk to somebody about their spiritual, what they're going through spiritually. Like, it's such a wide array. Like, I can follow scientists. I just followed this NASA, female NASA engineer. Hmm. Um, You know, that's exciting. Yeah. And And it's good for somebody with ADHD. But I will say, 
uh, you, I, you're kind of making your, and I do think that your Twitter experience is rather sophisticated, but I will say, um, it is not uncommon for you <laughs> to show me something from the internet, often Twitter. And it's always very sophisticated, and, no, what no, I no, show no, you, no. right? And you're... The super sophisticated stuff. I would say that... High level, big brain stuff I'm no, no, showing you. I would you. say 25 to 30% of the time, the thing that you show me is something that is amazing you <laughs> that then when you show it to me I'm like baby that's fake <laughs> <laughs> that is a lie that's not real I, that is a lie that I thought CGI, you know that happened once that audio was put on there by somebody that happened else. one time I'm good at spotting fakes I thought you were going to say that's why I was laughing because I did not think you were going to throw me under the bus I, I thought it was going to be I think it's thing. wonderful I love that about <laughs> you I love being able to spot the thing fake things that you were going to say is that I show you animals doing various things and I'm like can you believe yeah. and this animal is doing this? But sometimes you show me fake animal things. That's I think that was like once, like three years ago. Anyway, let's get, let's get to you, the questions. I love the way you use the internet. Thanks, babe. It's very sexy. Yeah, what did you tell me? You said recently you told me I was showing you something. You said, you I know, said you're amazed by a lot of things. Yeah, and you didn't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> you said I was amazed by a lot of things, but it. It felt like a backhanded compliment. It felt like there was a little jab no, in no. there. No, no. I like being around someone who there's a sense of discovery that is constantly. <laughs> sense of wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sense of wonder, and I really appreciate it. Uh-huh. How about we get started with okay, the question? Okay, great. Um, this is from Twitter. This is just a bell. What do you find annoying? Mm. Let's get started with that. Mm. But secretly endearing mm. about the other. Annoying. But secretly endearing. Now, I had a tough time with this one. Oh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> I don't find you annoying. No, I, I, I don't I find really you annoying either. I really enjoy your company. The same. We have a really good time together. We, we like dating one another. We, we like traveling together. Um, but, of course, we've been married for how many? 23? Two. 22. We're coming up, up on 23 this year. 22 years. Um, and so, of course, I mean, there are things that, that, that eventually... Uh, may become annoying, but, well, you want to go first? No, I want you to go first. Okay. And again, <laughs> annoying, but secretly oh, endearing. I just okay. want to, I, I want to clarify that. So when Jesse is talking on the phone to someone, <laughs> okay. What you're going to say. Okay. So. I'm just going to sit over here and drink my Sometimes tea. it goes like this. She gets on the phone. Mm. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Kind of like that. I'm probably not doing it as well as she does it. Well, that's true. And then I'm like, who died? Who died? Because obviously someone very close to this person died or they were in a horrible accident, or they just got a horrible diagnosis. And then you get off the phone, and I'm like, what happened? And you're like, Christy stubbed her toe. <laughs> <laughs> and then other times, uh-huh. other times, you'll be on the phone, and you're like, oh, no, I'm so, I'm so happy for you. Oh, that is wonderful. That is so wonderful. <laughs> I am so happy for you. Oh, <laughs> that brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, all right. Somebody got, uh, somebody won the lottery. Somebody Who got do a we, promotion. How many people do we know that have won the lottery? None, but I don't know, but it seems that way. Something incredible has happened. And then I'm like, uh, what, what happened? And you're like, Christy found her keys. <laughs> Um, so wh- 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 what I mean by this is that you are so expressive uh-huh. and you are so empathetic uh-huh. on the phone uh-huh. and in life in general that, of course, you, you, the thing that's annoying about it is I feel like I'm, I, every time you fool me, every time I'm like, what is it, it going to be? And then it's something rather insignificant, mm. which is, you know what? The reason it's endearing mm. is because it's way better than not being emphatic and um, empathetic. Emphatic. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
And also, this is not what I give people when they talk to me on that the phone. That is true. If you're listening to me talk on the <laughs> phone, it's like, okay, either someone died or he's like changing the nature of his cell phone service. <laughs> I, you know, you, you, don't, you don't know what... There's, what, there's a lot of... Mm-hmm. 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 I'm a businessman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Link's the boy, I'm the businessman. I, <laughs> so I keep it all business when I'm on the phone. I am... Um, I have some things to say about you being a businessman. Hold on, but, but I think it's, yeah. I, again, I think uh-huh. it's wonderful. It's, mm-hmm. I love, love the that fact that you, me. no, I, it, and I think I end up, um, I end up using this in the context of our coupleness mm-hmm. because sometimes I'm like, okay, somebody's telling us, this in person, somebody's telling us something right now that's difficult or great, and I just know that Jesse's going to give everything they need. <laughs> And so I can kind of just nod. <laughs> and it has handicapped me a little bit, I do believe. I believe that maybe uh, when I am when I have someone something happen to someone that's good or bad and I'm o- only one there, I start panicking a little bit. Mm. But I think that was happening before I came on the picture. Yeah, it's not my family is not great at this particular I am trait, not you know? talking it's about like, your family. No, no, I'm just saying that like we must <laughs> I love uh, again, your family. we could be pretty stoic is what I'm saying. Like <laughs> You know, um, and so, but we're all learning. We're all trying to get better at it. Now, what about me? What's annoying about me? Lots of things. No. One thing I have realized that I just want to preemptively apologize for is that I am swiveling in this chair a lot. I think me having a swivel chair is probably a bad idea. So if it's making anybody nauseous, I'm sorry, but it is soothing me. Um, so, you know, I think this is a common thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're driving in the car. Oh, you're driving. Yeah. Because you always like to drive. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I have something to hold on to. And. Steering wheel. I'm doing something on my phone. Looking at amazing things on the internet. Being <laughs> amazed left and right. <laughs> or <laughs> being very empathizing with someone on the phone. And we drive past something, often an animal, a cow, or a house, or an interesting... Are you getting a phone call? I think I am. I turned my phone off. Well, you, why, why don't you answer and empathize with this person? <laughs> why don't we get a real-time demonstration <laughs> what, of what how if... good you can make somebody, how cared for you can make someone feel? <laughs> oh, God. What, what if do you it, want to turn your phone on and do not disturb? I, I can. I could do that. Should I get up and do that? Because this lady gets all kinds of phone calls. Well, if you like empathize if with she, people, you get phone She's calls. a businesswoman. <laughs> she runs her own business, and she's constantly on the phone. We we took that trip to Big Sur. We were on, on the road for six hours. You were a business lady and things up over there for mm. three and a half hours. Mm-hmm. I was like, I got to just sit here and listen well, to the one side of a business conversation. How the Turns have tabled. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I don't like to take my work with me huh. to Big Sur. Uh-huh. <laughs> you want me to turn my phone off or not? Um, I think it's fine. I don't think I'll get another call. If I get another call. If you get another call, we'll turn Then I'll turn it off. Okay. Um, what were you talking about? Okay, on, yes. On so the there's something that in the uh, immediate environment mm-hmm. that we're passing that you think is noteworthy. Yeah. And you will say to me, look at that. (laughs) But when you say it, and I don't, you know, I'm a slow processor. I'm a little bit of a slow processor. I didn't play, like, basketball. But I'm just asking you to look at something. No, no, no. But sometimes it takes me a second. I'm not asking you to comprehend. And then you might... There's a very specific spot. So you'll say, look at that, and I'll just look at the first spot that I'm thinking you're talking about. But no, there's a specific spot, an exact uh, amount in the distance that you want me to look at. And then you get very frustrated if I do not look at it immediately. And there's a little bit of shaming happening. I don't don't believe that. that, (laughs) That I am not already in the car Looking at everything you're looking at, waiting for you to but say. I'm, first of all, I'm driving. I'm not. Do you looking. also see this? But it might be. Look at that <laughs> tree that looks just like a goat. Look at that. No, that one. Right, but maybe that's what you 
are looking at because you're driving, and that's an experience for you. And my experience is my. But I want to share my experience. Well, and with this you. is exactly why I find it. See, I've I've reframed this now. Mm-hmm. Twenty two years into our marriage, you know, there's that uh, Gottman Institute stuff that I'm a big fan of about relationships, communication, marriage. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're the ones who did the study where they could tell you within like nine minutes or seven minutes of watching couples talk. I think sometimes on it's like film, 30 on video, seconds. if they would, how likely they were to stay together. Mm-hmm. And there's some just things, ways in which we communicate that. Like touching like this helps. I mean, I'm sure that's nice. I don't think that's one of the things. <laughs> if there's do, caressing like this. I do like it, though. Then that means you're going to stay together. I like it when you caress my arm. Oh, let's not do that. <laughs> okay. So I've reframed this because one of the things they talk about is is in relationships are bids for att- bids for connection. Yes. So it can be with your kids. It can be with your spouse. It can be with a friend. You know, when you say, hey, Jesse, look at that cow. Look at those cows over there. Sometimes I just say cows. Right, right. You got a shorthand. Sometimes I just say the thing. The implication is please look at it. <laughs> and I don't look up. What you're actually saying in that moment is connect with me. Yes. See what I see. My love language is is look at that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, instead of being like, oh, my gosh, he thinks what he's looking at is the most important thing. It's more important than what I'm doing. I'm like, wow, he is wanting to connect with me as he's driving down the road. Mm-hmm. I get lonely over there navigating <laughs> navigating the world as you do business. <laughs> And I see things like we went to Big Sur, and on the way we passed the lavender fields, and then there's lavender's dead at this point. But there's lots of signs about uh, lavender tea and mm-hmm. lavender gifts. You were you are very interested and enamored by the pistachios, pistachios yeah. farm, the wonderful. That's the we passed brand through name. the wonderful pistachio yes. farm, and they had pistachios. Uh, they had just trees and trees and trees and then they had new places that they were going little baby pistachio trees mm-hmm. i'm just so fascinated by yeah, that yeah and you wanted to share your fascination and it's the same it's actually the same as me saying look at this crazy giant squid right but i that they but, found but that's why i tell you about things in real life because those pistachio, well, the, pistachio trees are not fake the, they were real it was very and, and that's one of the ways we know that they were real is we were driving by them and so what I'm doing is I'm this trying is, to. This is not a bid for connection. I'm giving you telling an opportunity someone to that learn. they look at fake th- that like, they show you, you fake the, things. You that's a, not a bid for you connection. You see those trees? They that's not photoshopped. Mm-hmm. That's real life. And if you start learning the difference between pho- photoshopped things and real life things, then nobody can dupe you. I'm just worried about you getting duped. Uh-huh. Okay. If somebody sends you a picture of me doing something that's clearly photoshopped. Mm-hmm. I, you got to be able to spot it. This sounds like you're preparing for some, <laughs> preparing me to get some kind of bad hey, pictures. Here's the thing: is that CGI uh-huh. and AI? I know about and the, AI and the conversion. I know about AI things. because uh, there was a period where that is. I know about AI because I'm a person who lives in the world right. and I read things. You've seen a movie or two. But there was also a period where every date we went out on, the only thing that you would talk about is AI. And well, tur- how concerned how concerned you were and what we were going to do about it. And we're not going to do anything about AI. Yeah, we are like, going to be AI'd I haven't solved in it. whatever way that means. Okay, next question. Okay, would you like a, to do a voicemail? Yes. Let's do that. We have that capability as well. Hey, Rhett and Jesse. Uh, my name is Mia. And I've been married for about four years, coming up this November. But, um, you know, we all know the secret to, well, not so secret to a long-lasting marriage is 
communication, loyalty, all that good stuff. But I wanted to see if you guys had any secrets for the little things or silly things that you think has made your marriage last so long and keep it fun. Thanks, guys. Bye. So watch this. I'm going to do a kind of a cool professional podcast thing. Mm. And I'm going to say, we'll answer that question in a minute. <laughs> I'm just trying to impress. <laughs> I'm just trying to impress my wife. Uh, but first, do you know about this? I don't know if you know about this. Well, tell me. Uh, you do know that we're oh, releasing a yes, cookbook. Yes, I know about this. Yes. So this is something that everybody out there in mythical land has requested time and time again. When are you guys going to have a cookbook? I mean, you're making all these, not us, but Josh and the team are making all these incredible recipes. When are we going to have a cookbook? And we're like, well, when we can do it right. You know how we do things at Mythical? We don't like to be first. We like to, you know, be third or fourth and then do it right. And um, so the Mythical cookbook written by Josh with the support of the entire Mythical Kitchen team. This thing, of course, features a lot of the fan favorite recipes that we have enjoyed on the show and then a lot of new stuff that mm -hmm. they have developed. You know, they've been, I mean, it's like a lab over there. I mean, it's like a kitchen, but it's like a very scientific kitchen. Yeah, you actually came home telling me how good the cookbook was going to be and how excited you were. And, that, and how not making that up. I'm not. And how we were going to have to make everything in the cookbook. Well, because I went to the photo shoot, which was very fun. We did a really awesome photo shoot. The visuals in the cookbook are going to be incredible. And also the cover, which I'm on. <laughs> I mean, but so is Josh, and so is Link, and so is a lot of food. And um, th we had a lot of mythical people inside this photo shoot, but also just the way the food looks. We had to have the food there, and we were eating the food in some of the shots, and it's just so good. They do such a good job. And now you can do that at home, and you can pre-order. This thing doesn't come out until March of next year, but you can pre-order it, so you will get it in the mail as soon as you possibly can. It also helps with sales numbers if you pre-order it. So do that. Uh, mythical.com slash cookbook. We made it very simple. Mythical.com slash cookbook. You can go over and pre-order it right now. And also, as we've been asking you lately, if you enjoy this podcast, not just this particular episode, which I'm sure you but are. But especially because, this one. Because I have a much better co-host this week. <laughs> um, but if you enjoy this podcast in general, please rate it and review it wherever you enjoy it. That's also very helpful. Ear Biscuits is supported by Rosetta Stone. You know why learning a new language is so good? Well, there's multiple reasons, Link. I don't know which one you're about to say. Because it helps you communicate with people who don't speak uh, yes. the language. The most speak. obvious answer. Yep, yep, that's a good one. It's also really good for your brain to yes. learn a new language. Yes, it can keep your brain from aging. In comes Rosetta Stone, the most trusted language learning program that truly immerses you in the language you want to learn. They've used trusted experts for 30 years with millions of users and 25 languages offered, including but not limited to Spanish, French, German, Korean, Japanese, Dutch, and Arabic. It's built for fast language acquisition, having no English translation, so you really learn to speak, listen, and think in that language. And it's super convenient with both desktop and app options with audio companion and ability to download lessons offline. And it's an amazing value as Lifetime membership has all 25 languages for any and all trips or language needs in life. A $299 program, but with our code, you can get it for just $179. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, you can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 40% off. That's $179 for unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 40% off at rosettastone.com slash ear today. See how I did that? That was so good. Did you find it a, a little bit sexy? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Jesse, do you remember the question? I do. I got, it's like a lockbox in there. The little things. Yeah. Not the obvious things. Right. Like communication and loyalty. Mm -hmm. Boring. What are the little things, the silly things that are a secret to a long-lasting relationship? Do you want to start or no, you want me to? I'm just teeing it up for you. So many. First of all, I would like to preface this by saying I like to preface a lot of things because I don't want to be misunderstood. I 
will not give advice. None of this is advice. I think that there are very few people that I'm, no, there are a lot of people I'm willing to take advice from. I shouldn't say that. I just don't want to be one of the people who gives advice. I will say what has been helpful in our relationship. Okay. Every situation is different. Thank you for couching that. Yep. In our relationship, I think, and this is actually, I think this goes back, everything goes back to the Gottman Institute, of little affirmations, little positive things. When you come home from work, I always feel really happy to see you, and we usually give each other a hug or a kiss. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it weaves positive interactions. Even if after that, I'm like, this happened today, or I'm pissed, or why did you do this? And da, da, da. like, it started off in a safe, positive place. And I think when there are a lot of those, when you have those in the bank, um, it creates a level of comfort and trust and safety. Hmm. That was a great answer. It almost sounded like advice. <laughs> it was just, not <laughs> advice. Just so you realize. FYI. That. No, not advice. Um, uh, I don't necessarily know if this is... Well, I'll ask you if you perceive this as a good thing, because sometimes it might feel a little bit like a an escape hatch from a difficult situation. But... Um, well, the nature, and I've talked about this on the podcast quite a bit, mm -hmm. the nature of our conflict um, over the course of our marriage is, re I don't know, I'm just spitballing here in terms of like, as it is compared to the average couple, probably high frequency, low amplitude, mm -hmm. right? There tends to, you t most couples tend to be on one side of that. Sometimes there's like, we never fight, but when we do, you better watch out, or we have lots of little disagreements, but very rarely like a big blow up, which we're a little bit more on that side, which because mm -hmm. we both kind of speak our minds. And so it isn't unusual in a given week of interactions for me to do something that makes you mad, right? And I have found that if I can make you laugh in, in that moment, it's very helpful to me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, do, I think, and, and I feel like it's it's like the button that I push a lot. I I love that. I think laughter is like one of the most being silly. We talked about this recently. How being silly is one of the most healing things. Mm -hmm. And I think especially in the middle of discomfort, there's a way to be silly, which is bypassing an actual hard conversation. It's like not listening to somebody. I think. You and I are at the point where we're like, I, if, if you're being silly and it feels like a bypass, I would just say that. But I think usually it can just bring you back to the love you have for that person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, most things are not that serious. Like, yeah, I wouldn't do this if it was like a real serious thing. Right. But there are times when I'll, You'll get mad about something, and I'll do an impersonation of you, <laughs> which might it might it might seem it, 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 me saying that might sound like it feels patronizing or or minimizing. Well, I think the thing that's but, funny is I get mad, and you kind of like it. Yeah, I kind of. <laughs> You don't, you're not, you're not scared of me getting mad. That has in our relationship, we've always had like we talk about stuff. I like your we, passion. We talk stuff out and we sometimes But we get very we get very real. We do. I'm not trying to not make it real. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Anyway, I so I don't know if that again, I don't know if that was advice. And if it was, I don't know if it was good advice. I so Well I mean it's not when your partner gets mad at you today, <laughs> laugh at them or make them no make them laugh. Uh, that's it advice. diffuse it diffuses that sometimes it can diffuse laughter can diffuse if it backfires anger. though it's bad that's it's and, and you didn't tell him to do it if it you backfires. gotta know when to pull the trigger okay um this is a this this question is kind of in the same vein but um the thing I'm interested in is the second part of the question okay 
so we can give a fresh answer. This is from Validity XP on Twitter. Uh, after being married for so many years, how do you keep the romance fresh? Or were there periods of zero romance, and how did you overcome those? Mm. Periods of zero That's romance. Good. Do you recall any of these? I do. Fleeting moments? I do. I mean, I think we've had, you know, this is, in any marriage, There, it's, my mom would say, it's like the ocean, you know, there are, there, it, there are waves, and you kind of have to learn to ride the waves. Um, and I love that, because we have this idea, I mean, I don't think anybody actually has this idea that it's always perfect, but I think the longer you're married, the more you see that there are, it's kind of like seasons, <laughs> and hopefully it it doesn't last as long as an actual season does. But I do remember specifically, I think it was 2017. Okay. Uh, I spent a lot of that year mad at you. Mm. Maybe it was 2017 going into 2018. I'm trying to, I probably tw started in 2017. Um, that was the year you, you were working a lot. Yeah, that was a rough year. And... It, there was, uh, you had everything you regularly do, GMM, all of that, but then you guys. But, it, but the GMM was the. GMM 22. It was when we were doing the five or five episodes a day, basically, and for a really long period of time, we were shooting multiple things every single day without, mm -hmm. without pausing, but then on top of that. You were writing a book. You were touring. Mm -hmm. You were. Was it buddy system also? There was a buddy system season in there. It was any of those one things would have been enough. It was too much. And it was too much. That was the year you started having the thing in your eye that World War II vets have, where they start lose or they first saw it in World War II. Central serous retinopathy. Yeah, and uh, you started kind of your eyesight was being affected. Mm -hmm. Couldn't see in the middle of one eye. Right. But and, I had another one. Uh huh. And they said they the doctor was like, "Well, you you need to reduce your stress." Mm. And um, I said, "You're going to therapy." Oh, we need that. <laughs> and uh, and so that had already begun began that year. Uh huh. But then you were on tour. It was Valentine's Day, and you were in London, and I was going through some hard transitions with the kids, going through some stuff. And I was eating, like, really bad pizza. Mm-hmm. London, come on, y'all. And uh, it was a personally really challenging time for me, and it was coming on the end of, like, a, the year had been challenging before. And you sent me... A huge bouquet of yellow roses. Thank and you. now, thank you for your service. <laughs> this is this is. Pro <sighs> I don't know. I might uh, be. I might be perceived as a bitch after this, or like as a spoiled. Oh, on, I don't know. You can't do that. But at that point, we had been married what eighteen years, seventeen years, and one of the things that you should have known about me, <laughs> and I think you did, was that, like, I'm not a huge flowers girl, but I'm especially not really a roses girl. Mm. Double whammy. Uh-huh. And it felt... But they were yellow. <laughs> and yellow, I don't know where yellow came from. Yellow was fine. Yellow is not my favorite color. Yellow is not, you know. Well, I'll explain in a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, it really just gutted me. You did not feel seen. I did not feel seen. It wasn't like some flowers might be some roses, yellow roses might be somebody's romantic dream. You know, for me, it was like, I feel like I've been holding down the fort all year long with a semi-absent husband. You were doing the best you could, but it was a lot. Um, and he is not here on Valentine's Day. And not only is he not here, 
he's sending me something that you could literally send to anyone on the street. Like you don't have to know anything about a person to send them these yellow roses. And in fact, it kind of means you haven't been listening at all. (laughs) And so... So it wasn't a romantic gesture. It, I did not feel romanced by that gesture. Perception. And we, we, I actually told you I was going to talk about this because this was a hard thing. So I don't want everybody Let's act to like think. We, I didn't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> so oh, I'm so surprised you're sharing this. I, I think you called me. I don't know, but I basically said I will speak to you in a therapist's office. Oh. And like I had never heard anything like that. I will not speak to you until then. And you know, I am not a proponent of like game playing. If somebody's out of town and just saying like I'm not gonna speak to you, but it was kind of a crisis point for us. Maybe, maybe we'll I probably have more, but that I feel like when I look back in our marriage, that was a really big point because. There was a way that we had both been doing things, me included. I mean, I am I am a pretty emotionally needy person, and I think I was looking to be have a lot of my needs met in you. And while that's normal, f- wanting your spouse to meet emotional needs, I think I, I wasn't doing the personal work. At least I hadn't been for some years. At that point— I had started therapy You'd and been had in started for a couple of years. figuring out. I was try, I was a newbie trying to figure out what my own stuff was. Well, and I it, one of the things too, and this is looking back on that on that time. Sometimes when you uh, have been, uh, I mean, first of all, we both have been changing and growing mm-hmm. over the course of our entire lives, mm-hmm. right? It wasn't until it wasn't like oh, and it. Up until we got to therapy, like there was no personal growth at all. Right. But I think that sometimes when it comes to therapy or anything that is beneficial for someone's personal growth, uh, you kind of lose perspective. They're like, I don't know what's, I don't know what's changing about me. I can't perceive the change. Mm-hmm. But when you tell this story, it definitely feels like a, you're t- you're talking about a different person, right? So. First of all, to further contextualize it in your defense so people don't develop this idea that it was like, oh, I got the wrong gift, and then you said, I'll only talk to you in a therapist's office, which if you just take a surface-level analysis of this, that might be what you walk away with. But the reality was is that it was a very difficult time. Um, I was leaving you to deal with a lot of things on your own as it relates to our family. Mm -hmm. Um, There wasn't a lot of connection I knew already that you were having a difficult time. I was having a difficult time with being so busy. And then I'm, I knew I was going to be, you know, across the country on Valentine's Day. So I had plenty of time to prepare. And I think that you had set up an expectation. Well, this is an opportunity. Again, some people are like, I don't believe in, you know, uh, card company created holidays or whatever, but I, it was an opportunity to express my love to you, but more so specifically to show you that I saw you yeah. and appreciated yeah. you. And then I did this thing that did not communicate that. So now just very briefly <laughs> in my defense, just give you a little bit of what I was thinking. So I knew you didn't really, really like flowers. I didn't know that the thing I knew you really didn't like was potted plants because I made that mistake really early in our marriage with getting you a very unromantic. <laughs> Which now I would probably plant. prefer a potted plant you, to you flowers. Would now. But um, but I knew you didn't really like flowers a whole lot, and I knew you didn't really like roses that much. But when I went to the website for this place, yeah, because it was definitely a website. You did not go in person anywhere. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Right there at the top of the website, there was this incredibly impressive, and it wasn't that it was a bouquet of roses. It was that they had somehow put the roses into a sphere, a the spherical shape. Have you seen this thing? It's quite phenomenal. It's not a bouquet. It's like 
there's a there's a thing on the bottom, and then they've create made the roses into a, and it looked bigger on the website than apparently it was. No, it was big. It was really it was a it's big, a big sphere. It was a big sphere of something that. I did not like. Right, right, right. No, but I'm just telling you. I, I, I'm sure it was expensive, I'm too. Gonna, I apologize, and I will get back to it, but I'm just telling you. I wasn't I, a complete right. dingbat. I was sort of like, this thing is very impressive, and I think you have to use roses to make this thing. And so I got <laughs> I got to the place where I was focusing on the wrong thing, and I quit seeing it as a bouquet of roses and saw it as a flower sphere that was very impressive <laughs> to me personally. Which I, I know what I'm getting you for and I, Valentine's Day. And this I year. thought that you would like this <laughs> rose basketball and that you would be like, that's I pretty love, impressive. Because I love basketball. And it was like one of the more expensive things there. Yes. So I was like, well, this is. And then the reason I got yellow is because um, I was like, well, getting her the red ones, I know she doesn't even really like roses, but most roses are red. <laughs> but if I get her yellow roses, maybe they'll pass as something else in this sphere. <laughs> It was, I'm not, I'm just telling you, I shouldn't have done it, but. I mean, there. There was a convoluted thought process. There that are much to it. worse things. I think it was emblematic of where our relationship yeah, was. There's at a that million point. different things I could have done. Yes. And also, there's a million different things I could have done uh, leading up to it to show <laughs> my care. So, anyway, um, what I ended up doing was, we, like, we did not talk on the phone for maybe three days while I was overseas, which was highly unusual for us to not touch base every single day if we're tra- if I'm traveling, mm-hmm. you know. We have our little check-in. And um, then I was, like, kind of scrambling because I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to do? I can't make her laugh from over here, <laughs> you know. So I ended up finding a cool shirt. You did. You went to a vintage store and got me a shirt that I loved and still have. I mean, the shirt didn't. It fix wasn't the it, shirt that fixed it. That was the. Sh- we, we ended we, up having a, a session. A few, I think, or at least one. Yeah, that was actually we had some breakthroughs, and I think one of the breakthroughs was uh, we were both already having individual breakthroughs, and that was one of the things that my therapist had said early on when I talked about some of our marital, the things that we struggled with, was that he felt like it would be more beneficial in the beginning for us to work on our own individual issues and that that would spill over into the marriage. And um, I kind of didn't believe him. That seemed crazy to me. And it was true. Um, And I think the benefit for me was that for both of us was that we were both working on things individually. Um, I think it, it would have to be really hard to be in a relationship where, you know, only one party was willing to do the work because um, it's hard. And there are many days where I say, like, I feel like I've grown enough. I don't feel like I need to grow anymore. I'm tired. <laughs> I just want to get in bed. I don't want to face the stuff inside of myself that is gross or is scary or um, but anyway, having somebody who is also doing the work and looking at at the things that um, things that are challenging or the things that are hard, and I mean, you did that. Like one of, I think one of the big epiphanies that you had during that time is we had always had this idea that when hard things were happening in our, you know, in our little family. Um, or with me, that somehow work also happened to be really busy. And that was just weird how that happened. It always synced up like that. And then I think what you saw is because work is something you're really good at and you know how to do, you would actually maybe retreat into work um, instead of face the things that were hard in our relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, Because kind of like what we talked about earlier, maybe the emotional um, plane is one that can be a little more challenging for you. Um, I don't think that's true anymore. Like, I I really, I, when you say you feel like that was a different person, I kind of feel that way too. Mm. Um, because I think the way that you have in the past few years done so much work to be able to be present emotionally and to be vulnerable, even though that's a hard word for you to say. 
I don't say it. The V word. <laughs> um, Vulnerable. I, I, <laughs> Did I say it wrong? <laughs> uh, but it, it is hard to imagine that specific scenario unfolding for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, I just know I'm never going to get you a rose basketball again. <laughs> like, specifically, I'll never do that again. <laughs> But also, I think that, um, well, practically speaking, Link and I have gotten better about not overcommitting to things. Yeah. Um, we still work very hard, but it's not just a maddening amount of things all at once. It, and it was. There was a couple of years there. 2017 might have be the pinnacle yeah. of just the number of things that converged. Um, well, and I think I've done work around, like, I do think gift giving is a big thing for me and because I really like to give gifts and, and I think because our relationship felt challenging in other ways, I was, I was putting all of this expectation around whatever gift you gave me that that would somehow be a way that you saw me mm -hmm. and like giving gifts is not easy for everybody. And, you know, it, People, some people don't care. You don't really care about gift giving. And so I think as we've worked on the other parts of our relationship and they're more secure, I also am not needing the gift that you give me at a holiday to be. It's not a test. It's not a, it's yeah. not a test that yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to pass or whatever. Right. And it wasn't then either. But yeah, and I, and I think that we're just a lot more on the same page right now. And yeah. a lot of it has to do with the fact that it does have to do with the fact that we're in therapy, and so, and then we talk to each other about the things that. Oh, what did you, what did you talk about in therapy today? And we kind of, we have a different kind of connection. Our connection is yeah. stronger, and I kind of feel like I, I know where you're at in any given time yeah. more so than I did six years ago for yeah. a number of reasons. Um, but enough about that. Let's talk about my music career. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. One question, and because uh, in very rewarding ways, my little venture into James and the Shame mm -hmm. has been able to involve you, and it's been a way that we've been able to work together in a way that we always kind of wanted to, but never mm -hmm. had worked together. Mm -hmm. Mythical Miss B says, "What is your? This is for you. What is your favorite James and the Shame track from Human Overboard? <laughs> and will we get to hear you on the new EP? <laughs> when does this come out?" What, what what date does this come out, Jamie? Uh, on ten nine. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So the, the, at the end of this week. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we get to, we get to talk a little bit about something mm -hmm. here, or you do. Well, my favorite track is the last song on Human Overboard. It's not the one that's about you. I do you love it. I do love that, but that seems kind of like egomaniacal if I say that. Mm -hmm. Um and I also love the one about our kids. But the last song that you also sing on. Yes. Uh letters. Old letters. Old letters. Um I cry sometimes when I listen to that song. Hmm. Because I think it just really encompasses the person you were and the person you are and how they're very much the same person and not the same person at all. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, you kind of went through that little bit of an angry atheist phase uh, early on. Mm -hmm. And I think... Anytime you go through any kind of spiritual or major, like, paradigm shift, often you do kind of go, people go through an angry phase. Um, and I don't think all atheists are angry, so I'm not, this is not saying if you're an atheist, you're angry. I do not believe that. But I think yours was specifically stemming from just some of the pain that you were dealing with. Um, and I think as you've gotten further from that, there's, I think for both of us, there is an openness, more of a spiritual openness, um, and more of a peace and less of having a, 
view on things that is a reaction to an old view and more of a, like, what, where am I right now, as opposed to, you know, what am I reacting against because yeah. of where I was? And I think old letters it re- ends with that openness. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that makes me cry. Hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will hear you. Yes. On the new EP. The song that comes out, uh, if you're listening to this on the week of October 9th, I think it's the 13th. Is that right? Is that what I said? It comes out on the 13th. Is um, is a song all about you. You don't sing on that one. Actually, I did a six-song EP, and two of the songs are about you. So That's pretty good It's percentage. probably a little I'll excessive. Take it. I'll take it. It's kind of excessive. 33.33333% of my songs on this <laughs> album about you. We had a seventh song that we were sing- singing together that we just never quite cracked. Uh, and time ran out. That will probably be on something in the future. But uh, the second song that would just be a part of the, the EP is about you, and you do sing on it, and you sound so good. Um, but it's funny because the song, I talked about this at some point on a previous Beer Biscuit when I was talking about the songwriting process and how sometimes things come sometimes songs come very very quickly mm-hmm. almost fully formed mm-hmm. and the song the one i love to find that comes out friday uh was based on an experience that we mm-hmm. had together of me kind of finding you and saying that you're the one i always love to find and then Realizing as I said it, oh, that's a good country song. I think I actually said that. I think you I told it. you that sounds you like said a song. It. Okay, all right. Well, it, you made I'll it seem credit. like it was my thought, <laughs> and uh, and then we and then we got. I got back home, and it, the song like came to me full, like fully formed, like basically melody and first verse and chorus, like like in the shower. And it's like, okay, I'm just singing this song, and then got out of the shower, clothed myself. And wrote the song. And so that one's for you. It's about you. But I wanted it to be very like, this is just my thought about you given to you. So I'm not going to ask you to sing on it. It just had a purity to it. That's really um, sweet. But, I, but I've enjoyed working with you in that capacity. And also us like, you know, getting to perform together like we did at, at yeah. Mythicon. No, it's been, it's been a nice, it's been a big... Nice and big thing. That's very descriptive. A nice and big thing for me uh, to, I don't know, I've, I've had to deal with a lot of like my performance anxiety. You know, I was a music major and, and performed as a kid a lot and was a little theater kid. And then as an adult kind of retreated and didn't do a lot of that. And so um, it's been, I think, healing for me to revisit that in a different way in a different space and and figure out how I relate to that part of myself hmm. well I've had a lot of fun with you I had fun with you thank you for asking me and thank singing you for about saying me. yes <laughs> um okay let's do another Twitter question I'm turning this is from Sam I'm turning 40 in February and it's freaking me out not so much the getting old part, but the running out of time for things mm. part. I feel like my church background made me miss a lot of things. So I guess my question is, what advice do you have for what ifs mm. of turning 40? Mm. Hey, Sam. I think I met Sam at Mythicon. Okay. I love this question because when I turned 40, I had a mini existential crisis for sure. It was 2020. Um, you know, the last year we had spent in the house with COVID, everybody was in the house for most of that year, not us specifically. Um, but I just, it was like, I could not accept that I was going to be 40. This thing that had always seemed so far away was upon me 
and I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, well, and, and when we were growing up, Lincoln and I were talking about this the other day, when uh, our parents or our parents' friends turned 40, they would do the laude laude. Right. Diane's turning 40. Party. Which had the over the hill cake, over the hi- everything, everything the is death, black. Yes, the funeral. Right, totally. It's like, I mean, listen, we were in the South in like the eighties, <laughs> so people would be dropping left and right in the forties. <laughs> but horrible. I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, that happens. That does still happen. But I do but think 40's that not old forty is not old, and I I do think that like we have a different. I don't know. We think of of adulthood and and of aging differently than we used to, mm-hmm. but I do think that there is a lot to be said for grieving what could have been, um, and that can be in in any in tons of there's tons of examples of this whether it's like a job that you maybe could have had that you didn't or a relationship or children or a house that you love that you missed out on or whatever. Um, and I, I think that process for me, because I definitely relate to that, you know, I mean, I took a very specific path based on the culture that I was in and what I thought I had always wanted. You know, I was a homeschool mom. Um, I was moved across the country to support my husband's career. Like it was a very uh, others focused first part of my life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like I think that's beautiful. And I think it, there comes a point where you're like, man, do I know myself? Did I miss out on me? What are the things I could have been doing that I didn't do? Um, and so I think... Well, because in in the culture that we come from, um, a woman deciding to pursue some of those things that are her interests, pursue her dreams, her follow her curiosity, mm-hmm. those things are deemed selfish. Well, and I don't Whereas think that's... Whereas a lot of times those are the, the things be. that are... I'm, not, I'm just saying... Right. It, it, I don't think it's true across the mad, board. Nobody gets mad at the man for following his curiosity. Exactly. Right. And uh, so I had to, I think, allowing yourself that time to grieve, like it's one of those things that there's no way around it. You just have to go through it. And so really giving yourself the time and the space to be like, man, this is hard. I am sad. <laughs> I I don't know what that life was that could have been like the country song. What might have been? I don't even like country music, right. except for James and the Shane. Mm-hmm. Um, but the flip side of that is, you know, you don't know what hard and tough and bad things happen that you could have happened that you missed out on, too. So that works. That goes both ways. Um, and then the other thing I like to think about is that I'm as young as I'll ever be from here on out. And, you know, that great poet SZA says half of us chase in the fountain of youth and it's in the present now. And, like, I'm young. I'm 42. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little baby. (laughs) And when I am 90, this was a – I was listening to a podcast recently and they were giving tricks. It's Hidden Brain. They are giving tricks for savoring how you savor the present and how we make our life last longer Um, and how we motivate ourselves to do things that sometimes we don't want to do. And and one way is to play a trick, a time trick on our mind and to pretend that like we are our 90 year old self. My 90 year old self is, is Hmm. gets the chance to come back and sit at this table with you. I use this right now. Yeah. yeah, I've I've used it before too, but it was very confirming to hear it in this podcast. But like, how if if ninety year old Jesse was in this body right now, what would I would think I'm young and vibrant, and I would think I had the whole my whole life ahead of me. Right. 
And so moving forward, I just want to savor the moment and be excited about the possibilities. That is a great answer. There's very little <laughs> to add. Think about the what now, not the what ifs. Um, how about another voicemail? I'm going to make you stick around for a little bit okay. because we don't get this opportunity very often to talk to you. So, Hey, Red and Jesse. My name is Sandra from Jersey. I love GMM and Ear Biscuits. Okay. So I was raised in a very religious household. Uh, I went to 12 years of Catholic school, followed by four years at Catholic college. Should be noted around 10th grade, I personally stopped being religious, although I was still in that lifestyle until I graduated college. My question for you guys is, how do you navigate family members? I honestly, I get so angry sometimes. I just want to go into it with them. But they're not listening, and I'm just making myself sick with anger or what have you. I want to respect their beliefs, but they refuse to respect mine. But I still want to be the bigger person and not let it get to me. So is there any advice that you would give me? Cool. Thank you. Mm. You want me to go, or do you want to go? Why don't you? I like listening to you talk. <laughs> I I think I would broaden this question to just include talking to anybody that we disagree with or that is coming from a different place than us. It doesn't have to be family. Um, it could be friends. It could be neighbors, obviously, anyone that has a different perspective. Um, and especially now, I mean, we are very, very polarized in this country. Um, and it's something I think about a lot and I fail at a lot is talking to people who see the world differently than I do. Um, and, you know, I talk about it in therapy a lot. I am, I like to think of myself as like, passionate and fiery and my therapist has used words like combative <laughs> <laughs> and uh I don't know that he said aggressive but similar at words times, uh -huh. um and so it's been interesting for me to be able to kind of step outside of myself and and see that part of me, because I always kind of thought I was like this very, this rule follower who is very submissive, and that is in me, and then this whole other person is in me too, who's like down to debate, um, and you know, when I was an evangelical, um, that looked a very specific way, and I think I have kind of um, just transferred some of that passion now to the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been taking that apart a lot in my own work and questioning why I do that and why does it sometimes do I come away from those conversations. I had a conversation last week with a guy, not a family member, but a guy um, that, you know, we disagreed on some pretty big things. And I can often come away from those conversations feeling like they were pointless or they actually did more harm than good. And while, sure, it's great to stand up for what you believe in, and I think people have to, you know, it's really important to me to stand up for marginalized people or for, for injustice um, but uh, there is a way to do that that, as my mom would say, she uses this phrase, and I love it, takes a chunk out of you. Um, sometimes we get into these debates with people and you walk away feeling like wounded. wounded. Um, and so one thing I'm working with, I mean, the biggest, my biggest, the biggest thing I would say about this is like, I'm the problem. 
And when I'm in these debates, they're like signs pointing me back to the stuff that I have to work on in myself. Um, If I'm triggered by something somebody says, and things are triggering, people say triggering things. (laughs) But I think the more grounded and healthy of a place I am, the more I'm able to like actually listen and actually be curious and see that person as um, the way that I want to be seen. I don't want to be seen as a set of ideologies and beliefs. Like I want to be seen as a full person with hopes and dreams and a history and uh, wounds and, you know, who's trying to grow, but who's fucking it up a lot. Um, but I, I want there to be grace for me as a person who is also able to change. And I hope I keep changing. I hope I keep growing. I hope I don't get so stuck in any of my ways that I can't see myself and others for who they really are. So I think for me, when I have those conversations, I'm trying to get better at really being curious and seeing whoever I'm speaking to as a full three-dimensional, four-dimensional person. Yeah, I don't know how many dimensions we're in. <laughs> who, um, who is worthy of, of love and respect and is, deserves to be heard. Well said. And I think that, you know, for me and you, obviously, it's not like we are – um, it's not the same as if you are a, if you are a marginalized yes. person, if like, if you're a queer yes. person and you're having a debate with your family, trying to le- legitimize your own existence yes. or a relationship you're in, right. your identity, that's a very personal thing, right? But for, uh, most of the conversations, especially a conversation like if I'm having a conversation with somebody, I don't check any of the marginalized boxes, right? right? I don't know if long hair and beard is one of them, but I, I, I don't think it is. It is not. <laughs> Maybe really tall. That's, that's no. That even, is not. Even that. That's an asset. Okay. All right. So I don't check any of the marginalized boxes. Please. So Lord. <laughs> any debate that I get into about any of these hot button issues that everyone wants to talk about, um, what I the the thing that I'm thinking in the moment is like, you think me and you are going to solve like you and me whoever you might be, you think we're going to solve this issue right now? And do you, and actually, do you think that that's what this conversation is about? Because most of the time it feels like an argument is about two people trying to justify their own, their own Mm -hmm. beliefs, right? They're not really interested in changing their mind. And so, and usually there's a fear behind a very passionate belief. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you like, what do you really, what are you actually scared of that drives the passion about this particular thing? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Make- I think I think you have to be careful, and it's a very fine line to walk between using like that as an excuse to not engage in issue. And I, this yeah, is yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. saying, um, you know, that we're not going to solve it. But I think there's some humility in that. That is what you're getting at. That is like coming to any of these issues realizing that we aren't we aren't yeah. going to solve it. Don't get me wrong, this doesn't keep me from debating these issues. <laughs> right. I can't help it if somebody brings something up, but I try to see it in a different way and be like, okay, well, um I actually think it would be more fruitful mm-hmm. to make a connection to make a connection, right? Because um if we if I can say, let's not talk about this exact thing right now. Is there a per- is can I ask you a personal question? Can I ask you about something that's going on in your mm-hmm. life? Because if our relationship ends up boiling down to our difference in opinion mm-hmm. on this thing, then that becomes the subject of most of our interactions. That's not a relationship. Mm-hmm. So we need to have a relationship so we can develop mutual love and respect so that then we can maybe have a fruitful discussion about mm-hmm. something that is actually like seeking to understand the other person. Mm-hmm. Not just mm-hmm. trying to go in, into the defensive. And yeah, again, I and say in this, I say this as someone who's not. I'm not trying. I'm not defending. I'm not being oppressed. Right. I'm not defending anything. Right. So, but and I will say when I get into these debates, 
my MO is going to be to try to identify where the power imbalance lies and where the marginalized person is in this mm -hmm. situation and root for them. Mm -hmm. That typically, you end up being right most of the time, I think, if that's, mm -hmm. your, if that's the way you follow these things. But Well, I think, too, you know, as we talk about this in therapy, the energy is, it's such a, like, whatever, woo idea, but yet continues to be true in my life. My sister and I always talk about how energy doesn't lie. And, you know, when the energy behind me debating someone to be right, which I have done much of my life and continue to do, and I'm actively working on not doing it that way and failing, I'm working on it and failing. But the energy behind that is very different from the energy behind seeking to understand. The energy behind seeing somebody as a project whose mind you have to change is very different from like seeing somebody as this full person who's worthy of love, mm -hmm. even if you disagree. Um, and so I, I do think when you look at the people who have made the most strides in justice arenas, you know, or the people who are doing these incredible, th people who are serving people, um, often they are the most grounded people <laughs> because they know how to uh, how much energy to give and and when to to preserve their energy. Mm. And um, so that's something I'm just I'm thinking about more and failing at and and I think it's a great thing for us to talk about because well, I've seen it's you tough. exercise this in real time, and I'm uh, I think you're doing an incredible job. Let's do one more kind of serious one and then one really fun one. Like we're taking photos <laughs> and we want to do a fun one to end on. So everybody goes home feeling good about themselves. But I never feel good about myself for those fun pictures. I always am like, I don't know what to do. Oh, okay. Well, you're going to feel good about okay. this one. Okay. So um, this one's from Kyle. What was the exponential rise in popularity for GMM and mythical like for Jesse? Were there any sudden life changes due to the fame and what was adapting to that new lifestyle like? Interesting, Jesse. I don't think there were any sudden. I mean, I guess the most sudden change would be moving to L.A. Mm -hmm. all those years That's ago. That's when it all fell apart. Uh, but That's when we lost our way. I do think... Something that I've ha am, have had to learn how to work with and am continuing to learn how to work with is uh, dealing with criticism, not for myself, but mostly like for you and for Link. Um, you know, uh, there is, I think we both would say this is like, I feel, I feel all the time so blessed, so grateful so thankful and lucky and just happy to be able to be on this ride with you to walk alongside you as they used to say <laughs> to do life with you what other bad um analogies can i metaphors can anyway get on the horse with me yeah um but I think it's one thing that is challenging is seeing everything that happens behind the scenes and then seeing somebody log on and criticize a decision that you spent so much blood, sweat, and tears trying to, you know, coming to. Or, uh, and this isn't, I'm not talking about like moral failings. I mean, that's not, not, not that your deconstruction was moral failing. <laughs> it was the ultimate moral failing. What are you talking about, Jason? That That was challenging in its own way, and I, that's kind of even separate from this. It may be connected, but, you know, it's like let's you change a logo or you change oh, whatever. Nobody, nobody said anything about that. <laughs> and I, you know, it's like you're often eating and sleeping and breathing these things. Maybe not for the logo change. I don't know. Maybe that was a bad example. But 
you have put so much thought and energy and there's so many even other people and people you know there's so many different elements that come into the making of some of these decisions and as your wife and as somebody who loves you and has a lot of respect for you it's just really really hard to see somebody say that you to uh, assign negative motivations to those things. And I think like that's such a small thing to have to deal with, but it's hard because often as your wife, I do want to jump in and say something. And I don't. Don't get into the fray, Jesse. I do not. And I'm pretty good at not. But I think that continues to be something like I want to defend you. Well, I, I appreciate be a, I defend that you. and you letting me vent to you when I get home and we do our little hug and kiss and then I immediately <laughs> start wringing my hands. Um, it's funny because I uh, I was thinking about this exact thing in relation to, uh, you know, it's football season right now. I watch football. I watch college football. And uh, Did you see Taylor Swift? Well, that was NFL. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Travis plays for an NFL team. Well, yeah. And but yes, you he's said, wonderful. You said you watched football. I'm not much of an NFL fan, but yeah, I'm all about the what are the what is that couple name called now? I don't know. Do they have a couple name? Because his name is Travis and her name I don't, is Taylor. Yeah, I don't think it's been decided as of this recording. Okay. But yeah, this will be old news by the time this comes out. They're yeah, called something be. very specific. Or, or, <laughs> oh no, we're all going to be invested. We are or they all may be broken super, up. They may I'm be broken up. We don't know. super invested. This is I NFL never, Taylor's version. I have never <laughs> cared about the NFL until now. <laughs> Ever. I've, yeah, right. I can't. I mean, now I might them. get this, a... Not to burst your bubble, but this is probably... No, she was having fun. This. Did you see her? She was having fun. She was eating her little chicken strip with the seemingly ranch. I love it. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but back to college football. <laughs> the real deal. You know, uh, I follow NC State football because I went to NC State, and uh, I'm a big Wolf Pack fan, another word I'm not great at saying. Unfortunately, that's our mascot. <laughs> and, you know, like people just criticize uh, the coach, you know, after even after, like, he wins a game. Uh, the way that he goes about it, and then the conversation gets so toxic, mm-hmm. and it's funny because I'm not coaching a college football team. You're not, and uh, it's not like once a week we either win or lose. That sucks. <laughs> you know that yeah. sucks. Like I have a content stream, and it's like very subjective, and it's just like, is it going to get views? And we're going to make other decisions like <laughs> logo changes or events or changes to services or all the you know, hundreds of decisions that we make in a year about specific things that people enjoy. And, uh, but the thing that I always say is, and I and I actually think this applies to, you know, it's funny to get back into the polarization, political polarization in our country, since we haven't talked about that enough. Um, there tends to be this idea that people on the right are patriotic and people on the left are not patriotic. But Actually, like when you are a fan of a team, you tend to be pretty damn critical of the things mm-hmm. that that team does because you love that team. You are invested right. in that team. And so I tend to take the investment that people have in what we're doing and the things that we've built. I, even when it gets critical, I tend to say, you know what? I'm going to choose to see this person's concern about this particular thing that we have done. I'm going to see that in the light of them actually really, really caring about the things that we do. And it's a privilege to have well, anybody even give it. that's healthy. That's a healthy way to look. I'm, I'm, but, I'm not, I'm not he- as well, healthy as but you. But I will say the thing that, the part that really gets in my girdle is, uh, Where's, is, your, where's your girdle? It's just, I, it's just, it's what's a your, figurative girdle that I wear at times that keeps my tummy in. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have to think, think that's, about that's holding it expression. in. expression. It gets your goat. Uh, I, I just invented a new I one. I like it. <laughs> okay. And uh, is when they assign intention. Right. Negative intention. Right. Oh, they're doing this because flagrant assumption about our character or the way that we see right. our fans or whatever. That's the part that is upsetting. It's like, well, okay, 
I'm not going to get into it. I can tell you all the reasons that we made this decision, but I'm, I like the fact that you care. I don't like the fact that you assume why we made this decision and then begin spreading this idea, but I can live with it. It, co- it comes with the territory. But I really appreciate the fact that you care because I do think, you know, uh, like you said, we are hashtag blessed. Is that still a thing? No. Um, no. I'm bringing that back too. <laughs> it really gets in my girdle that we don't use hashtag blessed anymore. <laughs> and we have all of our needs are met and most of our wants are met. Mm. It, it's like got nothing to complain about. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't difficult things that I face or you face mm. that you, st- you still want somebody to commiserate with. You know, and I appreciate you. I'm a good co-commiserator. Being there for that because, you're, again, you'll, oh, <laughs> tell me more. No. I really like that. Pretty sure you. I don't sound like You don't that, do that to me as much as you do it to your friends. Um, but I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to exaggerate your, your empathy for me. I, I, you do it just right. Do you want to end on a fun one? Sure. Um, okay. This is from Fast Acting Glue. Not a brand, not a sponsor, just a Twitter handle. If you had to eat a stick, Mm. and this is not a sexual joke, but I didn't do this to set set up a sexual joke, okay? If you had to eat a stick, would you microwave slash steam it or eat it raw? Hmm. I would, we just got those... Not a sponsor, but we got those, what are those Any pans? Day. Is that what they're called? Any, Any day? day? It's David Chang, right? Yeah, they're the, the, they were on TikTok and somewhere else, and they're the, you can, mic, these microwavable It's a glass containers. container that looks like Tupperware, but it's glass, and it's... Uh, With tops it, that look like they have some they aluminum, can, but you can... And they can release, they, they release a little steam at certain yeah. pressures. They don't pop uh-huh. off. And you can cook anything in these things. You can. It's crazy. They should be a sponsor because you can turn your, and I think it is David Chang. I think I'm right about that, yeah. right? Because he was doing this on TikTok yep. where he's using these glass things mm-hmm. to make his family food. And he's like putting like salmon in the salmon. microwave. Salmon. You can cook salmon in them. Like, oh, are you sure you can do that? You can. We have. We have. It's delicious. And yeah, I would put a stick in that with a little like Lowry seasoning salt. Oh, yeah, back to the stick. I forgot. That's what yeah, this is about. Yeah, we're talking about the stick. we got to put, put a wet stick in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, little twig boy should be all about microwaving some wet sticks. Right. Well, <laughs> again, I didn't think that this was going to get sexual, but the little twig boy <laughs> the little twig boy is not expecting the forest queen to eat his stick. Like, that's are we, not... That, Lord, no, I'm just saying, are we, that's not... Are we... we I'm about not... That. I'm, are we... I mean, are we going to dress up as little no, twig no, I'm boy saying he is expecting for... that, but that's not what this is about. He doesn't have to expect it. We don't even have to make it about that. Can we go to Rex now? Uh, I have some Rex. Oh, I thought you meant the hospital where our kids were born. <laughs> Rex Hospital. Um, that would be a long trip. Okay. Uh, yeah, so do you want to do that, like... If we talk about it now, we're going to have to do it. Dress up as the forest queen and the little twig boy as our Halloween costume. I don't know what else we were going to dress up as, so I think it's a great idea. I love when people give me Halloween ideas, but, costume ideas. Uh, it's such an inside joke, though. Like but people, that's that's what makes it fun. We'll never make it into People magazine with that. <laughs> we won't be next to Heidi in, in her worm costume. I don't think that. I don't think that's what's keeping us from making it. Uh no. Uh, okay. I don't know what the I, I I can imagine what the forest queen would look like. Mm. I've got some ideas. The little twig boy. Little twig boy needs some like leader hosen. But the little twig boy, remember, is the big bad wolf, but it's just the big bad wolf. Well, you know, it's just the twig our, boy pretending to be the Our first Halloween together, was you dressed up as grandma. the big bad wolf dressed up as grandma. It was it's a big full bad wolf circle, and, a dress. and I was Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah, it's pretty close. So we can dig those up, mm-hmm. but back to eating the stick. I think what I would do, um, uh, I don't want to make this not fun anymore, but I would grind it down mm. into sawdust mm. and I would slowly insert it into soup over the course. I don't, of a soup month. was not an option. 
I don't. He didn't say anything about soup or she. No, I, I, technically I would eat it raw, but it would be used as a thickener in soup, and it would go unnoticed. It would be. Fi- I, I would enjoy. That, fiber. I think you're cheating. I mean, I did add some Lowry seasoning salt, but I don't think that that's cheating. I think soup. Putting it in soup. Well, I would put it in a cheesecake then. Okay. Well, it's, you can't just put a stick in a cheesecake. You got to make it. I would dust. make it sawdust. Um, Jesse, it has been so fun having you here at the round table Thanks of dim lighting. Thanks for having me. Can I, I sign it? I, do I get to sign it? Well, we don't really do that anymore, but yes. Okay. We're breaking all kinds of traditions. We don't really have guests anymore, but yeah, you've never signed this table, so we need to make that happen. Um, but I would like to. You said you had two wrecks. Oh, I do. I have two wrecks. We've already wrecked any day Tupperware stuff. Uh, our dear friend Jacob actually wrecked this book to me. Um, and it is called Your Brain on Art. It's by Susan Magnuson and uh, Ivy Ross. Ivy, Ivy Ross. Yes. Ivy Ross. And uh, it's exploring what art does to our brain and how necessary it is. It's and bad it's for fast- it, isn't it? I knew it was bad for it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> it is fascinating. And there's this whole new field of study called uh, neuro arts, neuro art, I believe. And it's, it's basically the study of, of what art, what being in nature, uh, even doodling what all of these things do to our brain. And it's amazing and confirming and exciting. Mm. Your brain on art. Mm-hmm. Is that your only rec? Or do you- no, I have, I have, well, I have a lot. We could do recs forever. But okay, well, you need to give these to me so I can do them. I time. just finished a podcast called Girlfriends. And it is, I'm not, I don't listen to a lot of true crime. I you, I like cult podcasts. Oh, no. oh, I no. like scam podcasts. Forty-two year old lady talking about a true crime podcast. This uh-uh. is this is such a cool podcast. It's about a um, woman who went missing in New York in the eighties, and all of these incredible women who came together to convict her. Uh, plastic surgeon husband um but it deals with like it's always the plastic surgeon uh domestic violence and um it's a really beautiful tribute to women who have um been murdered or been abused through domestic violence but it's also weirdly um an amazing look into these women's lives and and there is a lot of laughter and the music is incredible in fact the music was so good that was composed for this podcast that I downloaded the music on Spotify um but anyway I just I love it I think everybody should listen to it the girlfriends yeah um and speaking of listening to music I will take this opportunity to plug mm the song that's coming out this Friday, and the second single off of the upcoming James and the Shame EP. This one's all about you. And if things go according to plan, which at the time of recording, none of this is finalized, so this is a real risky thing to throw out there. Um, ideally, the physical album, the vinyl, the CD, and the cassette, along with some special merch for this EP, will all be available for pre-order. I'm trying to get a little bit more of a head start than I did last year, because I waited until this album had come out and like months passed, and then I, and so I, I would like it to coincide a little bit more. So you can pre-order, having not even heard all of the songs, you can pre-order the album. And I'm also trying to make it where you can, um, I'm promising a lot here. You got a lot going on. Uh, I'm trying to make it where you, you get a digital download of the songs when you buy it, but it won't come out until release day, so just because people asked for that last time. Anyway, that's the, I'm just taking this opportunity to promote it because it's a song about you that I'm very, very, very happy with. You're using me. And, I get uh, it. And I went out into the wilderness and I recorded myself singing a song about you. And I actually, for this one, I think I did a pretty good job. I actually, I actually sang it good. So I'm going to actually show that instead of just showing all the fails. 
<laughs> this was fun. This was fun. Remember, if you would like to make a comment, ask a question, you can do that by calling our line. We have a line, one eight 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 ear pod one You can only say nice things, though. That's right. That's how that line works. Uh, I mean, I think most of the things are nice, but that is not a requirement. But it is if you're. I think it should be a requirement. Jesse's making that a requirement. Yes. Only say nice things. That's right. Ask only nice sweet. Questions. Only sweet things. Uh, and keep the conversation online with hashtag Ear Biscuits. We like to know, even though Twitter is slowly dying, uh, we do like you to still have conversations about Ear Biscuits in places like that. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. Hey, Red Link. This is me and my me John and my wife Timmy. We uh, went on vacation to North Carolina, Thompson Island, and we decided to make a pass through Bowie's Creek, uh, you know, for you. <laughs> Anywho, hope you guys are doing awesome, and I love you guys. I love what you're doing. Awesome. Bye. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.